Now let's take a look at the role of the Rothschild family, the family said to be the wealthiest in the world. When Amschel Meyer Bauer inherited the business, he decided to change his name to Rothschild. Amschel soon learned that loaning money to governments and kings was more profitable than loaning to private individuals. Not only were the loans bigger, but they were secured by the nation's taxes. Mayor Rothschild had five sons. He trained them all in the skills of money creation, then sent them out to the major capitals of Europe to open branch offices of the family banking business. His first son, Amschel Mayer, stayed in Frankfurt to mine the hometown bank. His second son, Solomon, was sent to Vienna. His third son, Nathan, was clearly the most clever. He was sent to London at age 21 in 1798, a hundred years after the founding of the Bank of England. His fourth son, Carl, went to Naples, and his fifth son, Jacob, went to Paris. Rothschild soon grew unbelievably wealthy. By the mid-1800s, they dominated all European banking and were certainly the wealthiest family in the world. They financed Cecil Rhodes, making it possible for him to establish a monopoly over the diamond and gold fields of South Africa. In America, they financed the Harrimans and railroads, the Vanderbilts and railroads and the press, and Carnegie in the steel industry, among many others. In fact, during World War I, J.P. Morgan was thought to be the richest man in America. But after his death, it was discovered that he was actually only a lieutenant of the Rothschilds. By 1850, James Rothschild, the heir of the French branch of the family, was said to be worth 600 million French francs, 150 million more than all the other bankers in France put together. He built this mansion called Ferrier, just east of Paris. Wilhelm I, on seeing it, exclaimed, Kings couldn't afford this. It could only belong to a Rothschild. Money changers, those who loan out and manipulate the quantity of money, were active in medieval England. In fact, they were so active that acting together, they could manipulate the entire English economy. These were not bankers per se. The money changers generally were the goldsmiths. They were the first bankers because they started keeping other people's gold for safekeeping in their vaults. The first paper money was merely a receipt for gold left at the goldsmith. Paper money caught on because it was more convenient than carrying around a lot of heavy gold and silver coins. Eventually, goldsmiths noticed that only a small fraction of the depositors ever came in and demanded their gold at any one time. Goldsmiths started cheating on the system. They discovered that they could print more money than they had gold, and usually no one would be the wiser. Then they could loan out this extra money and collect interest on it. This was the birth of fractional reserve banking, that is, loaning out many times more money than you have assets on deposit. So, if $1,000 in gold were deposited with them, they could loan out about $10,000 in paper money and draw interest payments on it, and no one would ever discover the deception. By this means, goldsmiths gradually accumulated more and more wealth and used this wealth to accumulate more and more gold. Today, this practice of loaning out more money than there are reserves is known as fractional reserve banking. Every bank in the United States is allowed to loan out at least 10 times more money than they actually have. That's why they get rich on charging, let's say, 8% interest. It's not really 8% per year, which is their income. It's 80%. That's why bank buildings are always the largest in town. When Queen Mary's sister, Queen Elizabeth I, took the throne, she was determined to regain control over English money. Her solution was to issue gold and silver coins from the public treasury and take the control over the money supply away from the money changers. Changers, Oliver Cromwell finally overthrew King Charles, purged the parliament, and put the king to death. 
the money changers were immediately allowed to consolidate their financial power. The result was that for the next 50 years, the money changers plunged Great Britain into a series of costly wars. They took over a square mile of property in the center of London, known as the City of London. This area today is still known as one of the three predominant financial centers of the world. By the end of the 1600s, England was in financial ruin. Fifty years of more or less continuous wars with France and Holland had exhausted her. Frantic government officials met with the money changers to beg for the loans necessary to pursue their political purposes. The price was high, a government-sanctioned, privately-owned bank which could issue money created out of nothing. It was to be the modern world's first privately owned central bank, the Bank of England. Although it was deceptively called the Bank of England to make the general population think it was part of the government, it was not. Like any other private corporation, the Bank of England sold shares to get started. The investors, whose names were never revealed, were supposed to put up one and a quarter million British pounds in gold coin to buy their shares in the bank. The bank was duly chartered in 1694 and started out in the business of loaning out several times the money it supposedly had in reserves, all at interest. In exchange, the new bank would loan British politicians as much of the new currency as they wanted, as long as they secured the debt by direct taxation of the British people. So, legalization of the Bank of England amounted to nothing less than legal counterfeiting of a national currency for private gain. Unfortunately, nearly every nation now has a privately controlled central bank using the Bank of England as the basic model. Such is the power of these central banks that they soon take total control over a nation's economy. It soon amounts to nothing but a plutocracy ruled by the rich. The central bank scam is really a hidden tax. The nation sells bonds to the central bank to pay for things it does not have the political will to raise taxes to pay for. But the bonds are purchased with money the central bank creates out of nothing. More money in circulation makes your money worth less. The government gets as much money as it needs and the people pay for it in inflation. The beauty of the plan is that not one person in a thousand can figure it out because it's usually hidden behind complex sounding economics gibberish. In 1790, less than three years after the Constitution had been signed, the money changers struck again. The newly appointed first Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, proposed a bill to the Congress calling for a new privately owned central bank. Coincidentally, that was the very year that Amschel Rothschild made his pronouncement from his flagship bank in Frankfurt. Let me issue and control a nation's money, and I care not who writes the laws. After a year of intense debate, in 1791, Congress passed the bill and gave it a 20-year charter. The new bank was to be called the First Bank of the United States, or BUS. The bank was given a monopoly on printing U.S. currency, even though 80% of its stock would be held by private investors. The other 20% would be purchased by the U.S. government. Like the Bank of England, the name of the Bank of the United States was deliberately chosen to hide the fact that it was privately controlled. And like the Bank of England, the names of the investors in the bank were never revealed. Many years later, it was a common saying that the Rothschilds were the power behind the old Bank of the United States. Here in Paris, the Bank of France was organized in 1800, just like the Bank of England. But Napoleon decided France had to break free of debt, and he never trusted the Bank of France. He declared that when a government is dependent upon bankers for money, the bankers, not the leaders of the government, are in control. 